Hello, my name is Dr. Allison Hodacek and I'm a third year resident in the University of Wisconsin Family Medicine Residency Program in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm here again today to discuss septic shock. In our first podcast, we reviewed the pathophysiology of sepsis, and in the second podcast, we discussed the initial management of sepsis and septic shock. Today, we'll be discussing septic shock management protocols. As sepsis is such a common medical problem, there has been much research into whether developing a standardized approach to therapy will improve patient outcomes. One such study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001 studied patients who were identified as having septic shock in the emergency department. These patients were started on a regimented sepsis treatment protocol called early goal-directed therapy. The patients who received early goal-directed therapy had a lower in-hospital mortality rate than those who received standard treatment. The concept of having a protocol approach to the treatment of septic shock has subsequently been adopted by many hospitals. There is even an international organization called the Surviving Sepsis Campaign that has set forth global guidelines on how to approach and manage severe sepsis and septic shock. We're going to discuss an example of a severe sepsis management protocol today. As a family physician, it's important that you understand the initial steps behind resuscitating and stabilizing these patients. However, please keep in mind that different hospitals and different physicians will have unique approaches to these issues. Also, remember that every patient's scenario is unique, and some patients will have comorbid conditions that may require a more individualized plan of care. Recall that when we discuss the pathophysiology of septic shock, we discuss that the primary process underlying the morbidity in septic shock is tissue hypoxia that results from reduced tissue perfusion, vascular injury, and hypotension. Septic shock protocols are largely based on identifying tissue hypoxia and taking actions to correct that. The hope is that by restoring oxygenation to underperfused tissue, we can prevent damage. Here is an example of a septic shock protocol. This is actually taken from the New England Journal article that I referenced earlier. I know it probably looks overwhelming, but we'll go over it together. Once you understand the logic behind each step, it actually becomes quite intuitive. Recall from podcast one that severe sepsis is defined as sepsis with end organ dysfunction and septic shock is defined as sepsis with hypotension that is refractory to IV fluid boluses. Once severe sepsis or septic shock has been identified, the patient should undergo central line placement. This allows for better infusion of IV fluids and medications. It also allows us to monitor certain hemodynamic parameters such as central venous pressure. An arterial line should be considered for more accurate monitoring of blood pressure. Finally, if the patient is poorly responsive or not protecting their airway, intubation and mechanical ventilation should be strongly considered. If the patient is alert and protecting their airway, supplemental oxygen should be given to maximize blood oxygen levels. The first step in the sepsis protocol is assessing the patient's intravascular volume. You cannot correct hypoperfusion and tissue hypoxia if there is not enough fluid in the intravascular space. Patients with sepsis have low intravascular volume because of vasodilation, as well as capillary leakage that causes third spacing. The best way to measure intravascular volume is to check the patient's central venous pressure. This can be measured only via a central line. The goal should be a central venous pressure of at least 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury. If it is below that, the patient should receive boluses of crystalloids such as normal saline until the CVP is adequate. In some institutions, colloid is used instead. The amount of IV fluid required in septic shock can sometimes be quite tremendous. Once intravascular volume has been restored, you should address the patient's blood pressure. In some cases, blood pressure may normalize after very aggressive fluid resuscitation. However, often patients remain hypotensive despite receiving significant amounts of fluid. If mean arterial pressure remains less than 65, even after intravascular volume has been restored, a presser should be started. Norepinephrine, which goes by the brand name of Levafed, is the presser of choice. 
Norepinephrine has alpha adrenergic agonist activity, which causes vasoconstriction. This combats the inflammatory vasodilation that occurs in septic shock. Norepinephrine should be titrated to achieve a mean arterial blood pressure above 65. So now at this point, we know that there is enough fluid in the blood vessels to perfuse tissue. We also know that there should be enough pressure to provide adequate tissue perfusion. But how do we know that tissue is really being oxygenated? The answer is by checking a venous oxygen saturation, or SVO2. Venous oxygen saturation is the percent of oxygenated blood in the venous system. As you can see from this graphic, venous oxygen content depends on the amount of blood that the heart is pumping to tissue and the amount of hemoglobin in the blood. Additionally, the tissue oxygen demand, or the amount of oxygen that the tissues suck out of the blood, also impacts SVO2. A low SVO2 tells us that tissue is not being perfused with enough oxygen. So as you can see, if the hemoglobin is low, there will be inadequate oxygen delivery to tissues and SVO2 will be low. Likewise, if cardiac output is low, then oxygen delivery to tissue will not be adequate and SVO2 will be low. So by working backwards, if we check the SVO2 and it is less than 70%, measures should be taken to address these potential causes of poor oxygenation. A hematocrit should be checked, and if it is less than 30, the patient should undergo a red blood cell transfusion. Red blood cells should be given until the hematocrit is above 30 or SVO2 is above 70%, whichever comes first. If the hematocrit is over 30, but SVO2 is still less than 70%, we should address the cardiac output. An inotropic presser, such as dobutamine, should be started. Dobutamine stimulates beta-1 adrenergic receptors, which increase cardiac contractility and thus cardiac output. Dobutamine should be titrated to achieve an SVO2 above 70%. Once central venous pressure, mean arterial pressure, and central venous oxygen saturation have been corrected, the resuscitation is considered quote unquote complete. However, the patient must be constantly reevaluated to ensure these parameters are not worsening. Central venous pressure, mean arterial blood pressure, and SVO2 should be checked regularly and frequently. If any values begin to fall, then that step in the protocol should be revisited. Additionally, the infection must be treated and the patient must be continually reassessed to ensure they are responding to therapy. Other medical issues such as DVT and stress ulcer prophylaxis, patient sedation and pain control, and blood glucose control must be watched as well. So in summary, sepsis protocols can be an organized and effective approach to managing the condition. Intravascular volume is resuscitated with the goal of achieving adequate central venous pressure. Arterial pressure is maintained with a presser such as norepinephrine. Finally, venous oxygen saturation is monitored to ensure there is adequate oxygen delivery to tissues. Red blood cell transfusion and inotropic pressors such as dobutamine can be initiated to increase tissue oxygen delivery. I hope you have found this review of septic shock management protocols helpful.